I'm Derricka Smith, and I'm talking about five Cornish miners who came to Whateley. They came to mine. It's an ore called galena. Galena is the main ore of lead. It can be smelted over an ordinary fire. It's found worldwide, including a little bit in Whateley, and two cities in the United States, Galena, Illinois, and Galena, Kentucky, are named after the ore that can be found there. This is Temple's History of Whateley. He wrote about, that was published in 1872, but he obviously had written it much earlier, saying that a vein of, or of Galena had been found, or what they called lead sometimes. And this is an article in the Springfield Republican that talks about, it says, work on the lead mines in Whateley is being prosecuted with vigor. That's a pretty deep hole. It's too bad we can't find it now, but I guess it was 100 years ago. 100, yes, 100 plus. This is the Edwin Bardwell farm uh, that the, this particular mine was located on. There were others in West Whateley, but the one we're talking about is this one. That house is gone. It was on the, if you're heading toward the hamlet of West Whateley, it's on the left-hand side. This is the 1865 state census, not, not a federal census. They were taken every 10 years. And it was in looking at this census that I noticed what was an anomaly for Whateley is that these five men were listed here as minors, all from, uh, all from England except the 13-year-old. I'm going to tell you who they were because that was too hard to read. They were, and their last name, uh, the three of them, their last name was Hoare, which was spelled different ways at different times, but I've mostly used H-O-A-R. The oldest one was Richard Hoare. He was from Luxullian, Cornwall. That's Cornwall and shows relative to the rest of England. There was James Hoare, who was 10 years younger, and his brother. There was James Henry Hoare, who was 13 years old and the son of James. There was John Pryor, who was 22 years old, from Wendron, Cornwall, and Samuel Wills, age 31, who was from St. Hilary, Cornwall. This is just a piece of the mine apparatus. It looks like a Roman ruin. It's in Luxullian, the town that Richard came from. It's an aqueduct built to carry water and mine trams, not to carry anything else but it shows you the sophistication of the mine infrastructure in that place. Then this is a mine in St. Just, and I, I can't resist from bringing, my father was born in St. Just, Cornwall, and these are the crown mines, a very famous picture, you always see that one of the crown mines, but his ancestors were all miners in St. Just. This is Aminda Bardwell Munson, and it's not Amanda, despite the many places you see the word as Amanda. She was born in 1784. She was the daughter of Lieutenant Noah Bardwell. She and her twin sister, and I've got the twin sister who looks exactly <laughs> like her. I can't resist that either. But if you notice that their hands, one of them, her hand goes this way, and the other one, her hand goes that way. So Aminda is the only one of the twins who married. She married as a third wife to Joel Munson, and Joel and Aminda lived in the Noah Bardwell house. This is not the Noah Bardwell house, <laughs> but the Noah Bardwell house no longer exists, and this is the house that some people know as the Hillenbrand house or the house that Wendy Curtis owns now in West Whateley. It's hard to get it. I just had to run into the yard and take a picture of it myself. Richard Hoare, the oldest of the miners, and that mine petered out very, very quickly. By 1866, I think the mining activity was over. Richard Hoare, who was the oldest of the miners, had developed a liaison with this woman, and her name is Lucretia Angeline Train. She was 31 years old. She was the youngest daughter of Roswell Train, and she was 31 years old, and Richard Hoare was 47 years old, but she was pregnant, so getting married seemed like a good idea. And they got married on December 30th, 1866. They moved to Conway. She had a baby in June, and then 
three more children, one of whom died, a little girl who died, and then she was pregnant again and died herself. And at that point, the select board in Conway decided that Richard Hoare was not a fit father for a daughter, so they took the daughter away. Her name was Angela, and after her mother took her away, she was adopted by people in Conway named Freeman, and she spent the rest of her life as Angela Freeman. Richard Hoare, in the meantime, this is 10 years later, he kept in touch with both of his sons. I can't really tell who lived with him. This says that he lived alone and also said he was an old sailor, which isn't really true. But it's a kind of interesting story that a passerby heard him groaning and broke in the door. He actually died a, a few days after that. Richard had two sons who did who lived, Richard and John. They moved to Providence, Rhode Island. They worked as carpenters. Richard had 13 children, including a daughter he named after his sister, Angeline. John did not marry, go, go, go. And this is what happened to him. He committed suicide by stabbing himself with a safety pin. Um, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? The younger, the younger James Hoare, who was Richard's brother, he came to the United States when he was much younger. I actually could find a passenger list for him. He went to Connecticut and married a woman in Bantam, Connecticut. They had two children, the young, the 13-year-old who ended up in Whateley, and a daughter named after her mother who died as an infant. And then the mother also died at the same time. And this is the very touching stone that, that he erected for her. It says, erected by James Hoare as a tribute of love to his affectionate wife, Mary Jane. And you'll see she died when she was 20 years old. James went to Wairika, which is not Eureka, actually. It's a different place, and it's pronounced Wairika, California. It was a gold rush town. And he went out there and stayed there and was there until 1899. The 13-year-old, it's confusing with these James and Henrys, but this is James Henry Horn. He was sometimes called Henry, and I can see why. He, ca he came to Whateley as a young man, a 13-year-old, and very soon married this woman who was from Whateley, who was Emma Warner. She was 16 years old at the time they got married. They lived in, up on, on Dry Hill Road, again, Lois Bean, I think, owns this now, where that mill was that has the wonderful, wonderful ruins. It's hard to get to now because it's owned by the Whateley Water, uh, Northampton Water Department, and one is not supposed to go out there. They had the one daughter who died, and this is her gravestone in West Whateley, and it just says Little Minnie. Underneath it says gone but not forgotten. But that makes you sad, too. Okay, John Pryor did not stay in Whateley or even in the United States. He went to Australia uh, using an emigration scheme concocted by the Australians to bring British men into Australia, men not, not convicts as had been earlier, but regular laborers. So John Pryor went to Australia, went back to England, found a wife, married her, went back to Australia. He was a miner in Australia and went to a town called Munta. And this is all I could find. Well, I actually found the names of all of his wife, his wife and children, but this is the gravestone. It says, in loving memory of John Pryor, our father, and in memory of our mother, Grace Pryor. Then we come to the last of the men, Samuel Wills, and he really was the most successful one and the one. He was born in St. Hilary, Cornwall in 1834 and was, the, was living in the Bardwell House or the Munson House in 1865. <laughs> and also living in the house was a very young woman, a widow, the, the stepdaughter of <coughs> Aminda Munson, and she and Samuel Wills got married in 1866, the same year that Richard Hoare got married. And they lived, they stayed living on in that house, and then Aminda Munson died in 1870. So at that point, Samuel Wills and Martha 
owned the house themselves. Martha died in 1804, 1904, sorry. Samuel Wills went to England to visit his relatives and he was good friends with his next door neighbor whose name was George Moore. And there's just a story that I couldn't resist telling another sort of horrible story. When he came back from England, George Moore went to pick him up at the depot in Whateley and he got out of the sleigh, he was, it was winter time, and he got out of the sleigh to go stand on the, wait for the train, and the horse bolted and got hit by the train and killed, and the sleigh got carried away and was found unbroken in North Hatfield, which seems amazing to me as well. But in any case, in June of that year, which is 1905, George, George Moore bought the Samuel Wills house, which originally was the Noah Bardwell house. And he clearly was not living there anymore because the newspaper, which was full of, all, basically full of little things telling you who was ill. Is, uh, that, but Samuel Wills was ill at the home of George Moore. So then there was another article saying he was visiting George Moore. And then there was an article talking about William Strip. There have been strips in Whateley for a long time since then, but William Strip parents and siblings came to Whateley from England and they all lived in the, in the Samuel Wills house. And I have been spending, I've been working in the Whateley Historical Society since 1915 and for that whole time I couldn't figure out ever what happened to the Noah Bardwell house. Oh, 2015, sorry. Yeah, I'm not that old. Um, I finally found an article saying that George Moore and his son were building a house on the Samuel Wills property. And so I was, I, and I'm sorry that we'd have no picture of the house at all. But Samuel Wills moved to Chesterfield, which is where his wife was from, and then died, and they, he and his wife are both buried in West Whateley, and that's their tombstones. On this one side it says Martha Damon, and the other side says Samuel Wills. And that's the end of the, what happened to the miners of Whateley.